It doesn't build my self-image to be called a sheep. They are dumb, stubborn, get lost easily, so needy. Yet Jesus calls me a sheep in chapter 10 of the Gospel of John. It's humbling. Hey, welcome back to my commentary on the Gospel of John. I'd appreciate it if you listened to the very end and hit like or give me a comment. I do appreciate your opinion. There are seven signs in the Gospel of John. Today, we look at sign number six in chapter nine. It's the healing of a blind man. Then we're going to look at a figure of speech in chapter 10, when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. There are seven I am statements in this gospel. Just before giving sight to the blind man, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. It makes me think of the song, Amazing Grace. I was blind, but now I see. Because of course, this sign has spiritual lessons for us. The context of this sign is important. Just before in chapter eight, the Pharisees have threatened to stone Jesus because he has said, I am. He is claiming deity. Despite these threats, Jesus is calm. He just keeps on going about his work of healing and teaching. And we can react the same way when people threaten us or make us feel unimportant. We can continue to believe that God holds our future in his hands. The disciples ask Jesus a common question. They want to know who sinned because in those days, people believed that sin and sickness were connected. In a way, it is due to sin in a general sense in that when man sinned, sickness and death entered the world. But this man being born blind is not due to any specific sin. David Gusick comments, think of all the times the little blind boy asked his mother, why am I blind? Perhaps she never felt she had a good answer. Jesus explained, it is because God wants to work in and through even this. Jesus pointed the question away from why and onto the idea, what can God do in this? Bruce comments, this does not mean that God deliberately caused the child to be born blind in order that after many years, his glory should be displayed in the removal of the blindness. To think so would again be aspersion on the character of God. It does mean that God overruled the disaster of the child's blindness so that when the child grew to manhood, he might, by the recovering of his sight, see the glory of God in the face of Christ, and others, seeing the work of God, might turn to the true light of the world. I like that comment. So Jesus spit on the ground, kneaded clay, and placed it on the blind man's eyes. Then Jesus gave him an assignment, go wash in the pool of Siloam. What do you think this man was feeling? He'd already been humbled his whole life and was begging just outside the temple. Jesus could have just used a word and healed the man. I think he uses this method for several reasons. One, the man had to submit to Jesus's touch and the man had to obey and go wash. He had to have some faith. Jesus found it important to change his methods of healing so one could never make a formula of the methods. The power was in God, not in a method. A great comment again by David Gusick. The water for this pool of Siloam came from Hezekiah's tunnel. It is a carved 1750 
feet out of stone in, from the outside of the city into this pool. I've actually walked this tunnel and it is absolutely devoid of any light. Salom means sent and Jesus sent this man to this pool. This pool meant life for the people of Jerusalem if they were ever besieged. Think of the details here. Jesus sent this man to the pool that meant sent and the water was sent through the dark into this pool. Jesus sent him to find new life and new light for his eyes. And later he is besieged by the Pharisees. What joy must have exploded. People should have been jumping up and down. Can you imagine how this man felt to see things for the first time? But instead, the Pharisees interrogate him. They had no compassion for him, even though they must have seen him every day outside the temple. They were just focused on Jesus and how he had worked on the Sabbath. Oh my, he had needed some clay. The healed man comes to Jesus, recognizes him as the Messiah, and kneels down to worship. He is healed spiritually and physically. In chapter 10, Jesus gives us two more I am statements. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. These figures of speech would pierce the Pharisees' pride. They were supposed to be the spiritual shepherds of the people. They were supposed to be concerned for the sheep. They were the guardians of the law, the Old Testament way to God. And Jesus was taking that from them? We need to ask, what is Jesus teaching us through all these images? I believe we have to be like sheep who follow the shepherd. We have to believe he cares for us. Jesus says, I will lay down my life for the sheep. So we have to humble ourselves and follow. We need to admit our need and our helplessness without him. That way we can enter the door, be saved, and find the abundant life. Verse 28 is a favorite for me. I can personalize it. I can say, I, Jackie, will never perish and no one can snatch me out of the Father's hands. Stop and try to do that yourself. Verse 32 sums up the Pharisees' problem with Jesus. You being a man, make yourself out to be God. And that's an important issue to resolve in our own hands. Who is Jesus? Is he merely a man or is he God? And if he is God, then we need to submit ourselves, not fight against him, we won't be like sheep if we doubt Jesus's identity and authority. And then Jesus promises us abundant life. The Greek word for abundance is perissos. It generally means a surplus. It doesn't necessarily mean a long life or a comfortable life. It does mean contentment, satisfaction, I picture sheep laying down in a pasture, a green pasture, and we can have the shepherd guide us, protect us, provide for us. We need to know his voice, and we can hear his voice in the word of God. This isn't just a one-time event. It's a daily listening to God's word and following him humbly. So let's humble ourselves like good sheep and follow the good shepherd. Here are two discussion questions. You may be confronted with questions meant to embarrass you, maybe about science or some social issue, and you may not have the expert answers 
but you can be like the blind man in verse 25. Read that verse and discuss your own personal testimony and your reactions when you are reviled, rejected, or cast out. Number two, what is Jesus saying about your relation to him as a sheep? Do you hear his words and obey? Or do you get stubborn and say, I'll do it my way? We all struggle with pride. What can we do? Mm -hmm.